when 9-11 happened here in this beautiful city and uh, created such a, a lot of pain for the victims, the families, and the nation. It was quite clear that the challenge of terrorism is a double-folded one. On the one hand, by the use of uh, police force, intelligence, and cooperation. And this was and is a success story between both sides of the Atlantic. Terrorism, we must fight against terrorism not only on the level where we have to destroy their structures, but we have also to dry out the roots of terrorism. And to dry out the roots of terrorism mean to strengthen all the democratic, the liberal, the largest forces, those who want to build up modern Muslim societies, democratic societies, in which the rule of law is constitutive. And there, the modernization and the successful modernization of societies in the Eastern Mediterranean and the Middle East will be key for success in this fight against terrorism. So Turkey is here in the center. Turkey is on the road to democracy. Turkey is on the road to the rule of law. And the influence of both sides of the transatlantic community, the United States and the European Union, but mostly the European Union, the accession process, contributed a lot to the modernization of this country. It's a long, long way to go. But even the longest way must be started with the first step. And there are more. There's more done than the first step. So from my point of view, it will be crucial that we can move forward on this long road and with common efforts modernize this country. But let me be frank, I'm very concerned about uh, um, uh, the negotiations in this autumn. The Commission will present uh, a report, and if this report is negative, there is a serious danger that the whole process could be derailed. I don't want to go into the details about uh, Cyprus, Turkey. Um, this is a very delicate issue. But I think we together, the transatlantic community, have any interest to move forward on this path of uh, the accession of Turkey, because this means modernization and transformation of this country. And speaking with Arab intellectuals, I mean, they all watch very closely whether Turkey can move forward and will be supported by the Europeans, by the West. This might be an excellent example for other countries in the Middle East. But if you look to that region, we see old regional conflicts at the top, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We see on the other side the situation in Iraq where uh, the perspective is very gloomy. We see, blockade, uh, bl uh, we see a, block, uh, a block modernization process in many Arab countries. But at the top, we see a new challenge, and this is Iran, its hegemonial ambitions and its nuclear program. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that there is a serious challenge. As I said before, I was opposing to wage war in Iraq because I was not convinced about the wisdom, about the reasons and about the so-called positive consequences, which I couldn't see in my analysis. But Iran nowadays is a serious challenge. We saw the war in Lebanon, and we shouldn't forget that this was uh, some sort of proxy war, and the influence of Iran was a very important one. The Iranian nuclear program if you look to the design, if you analyze the design of this program, makes no sense if you are interested in a civil nuclear program. Iran is working very hard to close the fuel cycle 
What for? It makes no sense to produce fuel without having a car. What will you do with the fuel? First you need a car. But there is no car. The only reactor in Iran, which is built nowadays, is a Bushir reactor. And the fuel for Bushir is, uh, will be sold by the Russians, otherwise it will not be finished. An own Iranian reactor design, it's far away. What is the purpose of a heavy water reactor? A research reactor about 40 megawatt should start in 2009. It will produce nine kilogram weapon graded plutonium year by year. What is the use for that? The whole design of this program makes no sense if there is an interest in the development of civil nuclear power. The West offered now Iran exactly what they need. If you are interested, we are not discriminating you. We are not denying you of your rights. We offer you cooperation to construct light water reactors, the best technology. This is an offer now on the table, and hopefully it will not be rejected. But from my point of view, we must be now understand the character of this challenge. If Iran will go nuclear, this will have very serious consequences. Some states in the region, Israel at the top, will see that as an existential threat. But not only that, this will also lead to a nuclear arms race. Neither Saudi Arabia nor Egypt nor Turkey will stay on the sideline and applaud. They will react. So in the Middle East, with the terror, with the old conflicts there, with all these very serious threats for the security, not only in the region, but worldwide, a Middle East, in addition with a nuclear arms race, is a nightmare for all of us. And this would have tremendous consequences for the European security posture. This would change our security posture completely. Everybody must understand that. On the other side, I hear a lot about the so-called military option. Ladies and gentlemen, let me quite frank what we are talking about. I don't believe that this is a good idea. I don't believe that uh, this will lead us uh, into a, a positive future. A military confrontation, this means an overall regional confrontation. Knowing the situation in Iraq and Afghanistan, I mean, the decision makers on both sides of the Atlantic should carefully assess and not only the first consequence but the second, third and fourth where we will end because I think this would be a decision which would lead us into a dark tunnel and nobody will see the light on the other end so what to do I think it's crucial that we make quite clear that we will isolate together Iran, if they move forward against the decision of uh, the Security Council of the United Nations with closing the fuel cycle. This is not a denial of their rights. It's based on the mistrust which was created by the behavior in the past of Iran. Closing the fuel cycle means that then there is only one political decision between capability, the possibility to go nuclear, and the reality to go nuclear. And this, I think, is a common concern that this should not take place. So what to do? I think economic sanctions are key. I've been in Tehran August the 1st, the last time, and my impression is that Iran is watching very carefully how united the international community is how determined the international community is. 
The final decisions are not made, and hopefully the present negotiations here in New York and the coming negotiations between Solana and uh, Lauriciani uh, might lead to a breakthrough. But uh, until I see it, I don't believe it. This is my uh, experience-based position. I think economic sanctions combined with an offer, with an offer for a grand bargain. The offer should be that if we agree about the nuclear dossier, and if we agree about uh, a regional security structure, so that Iran will say farewell in backing revolutionary forces and terrorist groups in the region, then there should be the offer also of full normalization and security guarantees. I don't believe in the wisdom of military-based regime change. Communism was not changed by military intervention. Communism was changed by a transformation process from inside and outside, and it was a very successful strategy at the end. So here we are. But if Iran is key, if Iran is uh, challenge number one, then I think we should also learn the lessons from the reason, reason the uh, conflict, uh, reason war in Lebanon between Israel and Hezbollah. If this is true, that the serious, the most serious threat for Israel and Germany based on our historical and moral responsibility, and this is bipartisan in my country, in the parliament, shared by all in our parliament, that the right of existence, we are committed based on our responsibility for our history to the right of existence of the state of Israel. But what we must learn from the reason war is that the new threat is not a threat of armies, but a threat of missiles, of strategic weapons. And this threat is linked to Iran. Now, if this analysis is true, then everybody should understand that Syria is playing a crucial role. If we would be able to bring Syria over, Iran would be isolated in the region, Hezbollah and Lebanon would be disconnected from Iran. It would be much more problematic for them to rearm. But without serious negotiations between Syria and Israel, I don't believe that there will be a change of coalition in Damascus. And last but not least, I think it would be very wise to understand that unilateral solutions will not solve the problem of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, will not solve the problem of uh, the security of the people and the state of Israel. So I think everything should be done carefully, but in a substantial way to move forward and try to open the path for restart of negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians. It will be complicated, but with the backing, with the help of a viable third party, and this could be the transatlantic community, and knowing the connection of all these problems in the region, I think uh, such a, a new approach for negotiations between the two parties in this tragic conflict uh, should really, I mean, be the perspective. This is our common security. When we talk about transatlantic relations in security, in terms of security, we are talking about the Middle East. And I think this is a common challenge. And what we need is a common transatlantic understanding, a strategic understanding. During the Cold War, we had such an understanding differences, of course, different perceptions. But I think the basic line was defined and defined the course of the common, common policy. We need a similar approach after the rifts of Iraq, I think,
And moving forward, maybe in a severe crisis with Iran, we need a similar approach because it's very important. Our security will be defined there. And this once again means that the European Union must understand how important its decision will be in this autumn about Turkey. Because if we isolate Turkey, then the Europeans will, will create a negative wonder. We will create an impossible coalition. Turkey is in a complicated situation. Where do they belong to? To Europe? To a greater Turkey in Central Asia? Back to the Islamic world? I think only the European option will work, or Turkey will be left alone outside the door. But then we will create an impossible coalition because Turkey will not stay alone. Russia, Iran, and Turkey, it happened never before in history because they were rivals in the same region. But if the Europeans act in the wrong way, we will create the impossible. And Turkey will be key for any Western strategy to guarantee peace and stability in the Middle East. Once again, this is our European contribution. Now, if this analysis, analysis is true, ladies and gentlemen, then Russia will be also an important player. But I don't understand the wisdom of a policy where on the one hand you corner Russia, by the way, with reasons I share. I'm not saying that uh, there is not a lot to criticize in the present Russian politics. But if my analysis and priorities are right, then we need Russia as a partner and not uh, a policy which will lead us in some sort of confrontation with Russia. Then we need Russia as a partner in security in that region. And we shouldn't uh, stop uh, our frank language about human rights, about minorities, about Chechnya, the independence and territorial integrity of the Ukraine, about Belarus. I'm not talking, I'm not uh, asking for a soft language, but what I'm asking for, what I'm, uh, uh, because I think it's very important is that we, we have an agenda with priorities. And if the Middle East is the major threat to our common security, United States and Europe, then we need partners, and Russia is one of that partners. And we need also Russia in the Balkans. We, Kosovo must be solved, but uh, if we define the rules on the Balkans, Putin will take the same rules and use it in Abkhazia or Ossetia. We shouldn't forget that. So the West needs a carefully defined political strategy. Now is the situation. Without a grand strategy, I don't believe that we really, I mean, can make it. This is the experience of the last years. There are other challenges, values. I will never forget that uh, uh, the, the, I think, really innovative and unique contribution of the United States, of your country, to the modern uh, foreign policy is that it's not only power and interest based. It was the United States who developed the foreign policy, and this reflected the founding of your nation. It was always power and value based. It was about democracy, it was about rule of law, it was about individual freedom at the top of the values and responsibility of those who are free, a free society. But this means that we have to stick to our values. We know what are the terrorists are fighting for? We love the death. This is the message of the terrorists. What are we fighting for? 
We are fighting for our security. But we are fighting for more. We are fighting for the defense of our values of a free society. And even under fire, we have to stick to these values and not give them up. This is an important dispute at the moment in the transatlantic community. And I hope that uh, the majority in the United States will understand that America was always strong when it combined hard power with the moral high ground. This is, I think, the important message based on the experiences in the history. The fourth element will be trade. In uh, Germany now is a discussion about a transatlantic free trade zone. It would be a fine thing, especially if we look to the Pacific Rim. But if I look to the reality, I mean, uh, things are much more darker, especially in trade, agriculture, WTO, we failed. We failed because there was a rift between Europe and the United States, not an agreement. And we failed also in open skies and other issues. So hopefully in a long-term perspective, this might be a project. But in the short term, I think uh, we need also serious negotiations, how we can adjust our conflict of interest in uh, the transatlantic zone in the field of trade. Take the lead in protecting the global and regional environment. This is, uh, I think, very important. Maybe in Europe, we have now inside the European Union 450 million people. Compared to the United States, you are, I mean, we are, seem to be a little bit overcrowded. Maybe, therefore, the environmental issue was understood earlier because the consequences uh, in Europe, um, the people, f people felt uh, a much more earlier stage. But we need the United States in global leadership for the environment. Otherwise, we will fail. If we look to China, the good message is a tremendous growth rate. If we look to India, the good message is a tremendous growth rate. But this means more than two billion people are moving forward into the global market. They will have the same wishes. They have the same wishes uh, than we have. They want the same security, the same opportunities for their children, the same uh, uh, living standard, and they have any, every right to do so. If we believe, when we believe, and I do that, in the equality of all human beings, so all human beings have the right to move forward in that direction. We are talking about the fight against poverty. The fight against poverty means that these countries will develop, and hopefully more than less of these countries will go down this road. But then the negative message is that uh, the global climate, uh, the resources, the global resources will be exhausted very quickly. And this means leadership. Leadership not only by Europe, but by the transatlantic community. And if we could get over our rifts in the field of environment, I think this would have also important positive consequences for the security policy in the 21st century. So there we are, ladies and gentlemen. As I said before, both sides of the Atlantic are not in the best shape. Europe must uh, find a way out of the constitutional crisis. Together, we have to adjust our policies and security policy in the Middle East towards Russia. We have to talk about our dispute in the fields of the values. Trade, I think, is very important for the future of the transatlantic community and environment. These are the major issues. Thank you very much that you were so kind to 
invite me and I'm looking forward for hopefully very interesting discussion. Thanks a lot.